Warning. Critique Revolve contains adult language and discussions. If you're easily offended, do not continue to listen. We're back here for another Critique Revolve. I am your host today, Michael Flores, and I'm in studio with Andrew Spindler. Howdy, howdy. And today we're going to be discussing the blockbuster film, Roller Coaster Ride of Excitement, Jurassic World. We're going to be breaking it down, discussing the pros and cons. And one question that I have received a lot on Twitter when I said and tweeted out that I was going to go see this is, Michael... Is it worth spending 10, 15, 20 bucks? And that is something that by the end of the show, we will let you know. Like our honest, simple, humble opinions, whether or not it's definitely worth seeing. Now, this movie comes, what, almost 20 plus years after the original movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, It is directed by Colin Trevorrow. I believe that's how you say his name. 22 years. 22 years later. Um, Now, it says that right in the synopsis, too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So 22 years after the events of Jurassic Park, Island Nublar now features a fully functioning dinosaur theme park. Can you believe it? They actually did it after all the, uh, the deaths and the killings. Jurassic World. As originally envisioned by as originally envisioned by John Hammond after 10 years of operation and visitor rates declining in order to f- fulfill a corporate mandate. A new attraction is created to re spark visitors interests, which backfires horribly. Now, the writers of this is Rick Hoffa and Amanda Silver, and it stars, of course, the one and only Chris Pratt, Chris Pratt, Bryce Dallas Howard, which I've always been a fan of of her. I love her work. Love her father. Her father's a fantastic director. And then Chris Pratt, I've never jumped on the Chris Pratt bandwagon. Are you a Chris Pratt guy, Andrew? I I'm kind of like on a weird teetering on the Chris Pratt bandwagon. Mm. Um he's getting typecast? Yeah. Um which is not good this early. Right. I mean, he's currently exclusively an action star and I kind of want to see him flex his muscles. Yeah. With his, his shirt on. His newly fumble, his right. newly found right. muscles. Fat Chris Pratt. You represent. know what? <laughs> fat Chris Pratt. That sounds like a parody bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, in uh, Parks and Recreation, he was fat and he was funny. I know. I want to see know. him do like a serious drama role. Yeah, it would be nice. I think he's kind of enjoying his new, oh, absolutely. his new body and his new fame. He's like, look at ladies, I'm hot now and I'm an action star. I mean, talk about a 360. You know yeah, what I mean? Or a 180. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like, it's amazing what he's done. I, l- listen, he's living it up. And he said in an interview the other day that he's in a dream and he doesn't want to wake up because he. Five years ago, he was a chubby dude. He never, he never, I guarantee you, he never saw this coming. Ever. Absolutely not. And I was got a banging bod. Yeah. Let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> banging bod. Um, now, to me, and we're going to get into this way more during the show, uh, to me, Chris Pratt was one of the shining moments. And again, I'm not a Chris Pratt guy. For me to say this, I know my friends have said, dude, that must have hurt you saying that, you know, admitting that Chris Pratt was the, the, he is the number one selling point of this movie. He's what fixes the issues that I might have had with this movie. He makes it worth seeing in a lot of ways for me, Chris Pratt. I think he did it as soon as he enters the screen, which might pain some people to know that he doesn't come into the movie for well into the first act. I would say, what, 20, 25 minutes? Oh, yeah. No, he's he's in there super late. Yeah, which is kind of amazing since he's headlining it. He's the star. Right, and his first scene is the raptor scene that we see in the trailers. Yeah, which I want to talk about that. But first, let's jump into the first act of the script. Now, one thing that Colin Trevorrow really made a point saying to everybody was his goal was to recapture the original magic from the 1993 Jurassic Park film. And he cleverly but lazily retconned the previous sequels, which is, you know, Jurassic Park 2 and 3. And for those of you that don't know what retconning is, Andrew, can you cue us in? Retconning is when a writer decides that something in the past doesn't make sense and they don't want to follow that. So what they do is they rewrite the story to make 
it as if those previous events never happened. Right. Uh, the biggest example of this currently, uh, well, in, in recent cinema, um, is the X Men films. Perfect example. Okay. Yep. Um, the X Men First Class and Days of Future Past. First Class retconned uh, the third X Men movie out of canon. Uh, Days of Future Past kind of brought it back in. Right. Right. And it was kind of. I had my issues with X Men uh, for the newest one, uh, Days of Future Past. But if you're going to retcon something, it's kind of a smart way to do it in mm-hmm. a way. They didn't because they could have. I mean, they could have easily did this. Brian Singer could have easily did. You know, wiped his hand and say, guys, guess what we're going to be doing? We're going to be rebooting. And instead of rebooting, they kind of cleverly retconned some of the elements they didn't want to have to deal with. Yeah. If if you're a fan of comic books, retcon happens left and right. Yeah. Are um, you a comic book guy? I want to be, but there's too many storylines and characters that intermingle with that. And I don't want to spend, you know, four or five dollars for yeah. eight pages. Yeah. Uh, I mean, granted, it's eight pages of beautiful art. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah, I agree. Now the first the the first act of the saying is I, I definitely have to say that the writing, though this movie is beautiful, the visual effects, the cinematography is gorgeous. I think the blemish on this movie has to come comes down to the writing. I think it was a very my favorite word to use in terms of lazy screenwriting is wonky. It was very wonky. You didn't really feel where you should fit fit in at one point. Like when did the when did the first act end? When did the second act begin? When did the third act even start? And I know you have some thoughts on that. Go ahead. Yeah, so my opinion is that I was looking for a fourth act that wasn't there, which, lo and behold, in a summer blockbuster, why right. would there be a fourth act? Right. But the fir- <laughs> I know, right? The first act, in my opinion, didn't... We stumbled across it. Accidentally, I think. Accidentally. I think the writers also accidentally stumbled upon it. <laughs> I, I would agree, because the first act, we're introduced to these characters, but we don't know what makes them special. Okay. Then it's only in the second act where we see some basic development of the characters, and the, in my opinion, the second act starts when the indomitable Rex, or whatever, what right. have you, breaks out of containment. Right, and you hit it right in the head. Basic character elements and that's kind of what they did everybody was a mere it was almost an, a mere image a mirror image of the previous characters that we saw in the 1993 we had the dr grant character which was you know um bryce dallas howard mm-hmm. would you agree i mean I almost, agree, yes. almost identical they both don't like children they're both you know consumed with work and their careers then you have um the the kids the siblings uh, rather than the brother and the sister, you have the two brothers who don't necessarily get along, and they and, and, and by the end of the movie they come to love each other, and and uh, and Bryce Dallas Howard also ends up you know realizing that she loves these kids. Go ahead. Did you say John Hammond or Doctor Alan Grant? Uh, Doctor Grant. Grant. I meant yes. Sam Neill's character. Yes, oh, okay. such an amazing actor too. So good. I would have. He looks the same. I would have no problem him. Bring, why couldn't we bring him back? As why well? couldn't we bring him back or Jeff Goldblum? <laughs> Jeff Goldblum's amazing, dude. Jeff Goldblum. You imagine Jeff Goldblum oh God. acting side by side with Chris Pratt. That would have been fantastic. That, oh, that Talk would be about amazing. the chemistry. Yeah, man. Because I mean, the only thing Jeff Goldblum has done recently, from my understanding, he, does, he did a commercial. car commercial, <laughs> and then he was also on the Tim and Eric Awesome Show. Good job. And he's arguably a fantastic actor, he's right? One of the best. Phenomenal. And I would have loved to see him return. That would have been a great. Maybe you know, we're definitely without giving too too many spoilers away. They definitely set up for another sequel. I mean, they left major plot points open ended with the escape of the one guy, the DNA um, splicer, the scientist. How he left with all the the goodies. Oh yeah. So I mean, they're definitely looking to relaunch this franchise in a very big way. Um, now another element that you bring up in the writing is the fact that we don't see Chris Pratt for about 20, 25 minutes in. And the first 20 minutes, I I, I honestly felt like, you know, and I don't want to be too negative, a negative Nancy here, but I felt like the first 20 minutes were almost like, what am I doing here? I'm in, was, I'm, it, I'm sitting here for a tw- for a $20, tw- uh, $15 IMAX ticket. I'm just pretending I'm the consumer here right, for right, a right. moment. Like I'm sitting here at an IMAX 3D film and there's literally nothing happening for 20, 25 minutes. Um, and then we see Chris Pratt and all feels better. And that's when, you know, you're dealing with a good actor is when an actor can enter the scene and kind of save the day. It, 
felt like you were sitting there waiting for the movie to start. Right. Exactly. And they gave us and they gave us tidbits. I mean, we all can agree that I think some of the best elements in Jurassic Park, not only was it cutting edge in 1993 and arguably one of Steven Spielberg's be- best movies that he's made, but the score was fantastic. That makes a movie. A, a, a good film score can make or break a movie. Absolutely. And I think we both were going in humming the Jurassic Park song like idiots in the line. I mean, we were like, <laughs> we were we singing, were, we were humming. I think we were giddy for that song. And no, go ahead. You were going to say something. It, That's fine. We were just all so incredibly excited. And yeah. when we do hear that song it's with the initial reveal of the park yeah and i thought it was too soon i would agree i i thought you you, you'll go ahead no 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 it was something that you're gonna bring up later i mean i totally 100 percent think they brought that that i mean when you're dealing with an iconic song like that you have to almost do with what what james bond has done james bond never besides the opening intro like you know the james bond song they never ever just Slam you with the James Bond song that's so classic now. They'll wait towards the main action scene. And all of a sudden, you've been waiting this whole time. When are they going to play the James Bond song? When are they going to play the James Bond song? You're on the edge of your seat for the James Bond song. And then when they play it, it hits you. And you got the chills. You jizzed your shorts. And you're excited. <laughs> and that's what I wanted with with, with, the, with Jurassic Park theme song. Is I wanted them to almost tease us. Like, give us the... What you said, which I, it was so genius, that just the little piano. The, just the dun, five notes. Dun, yeah, just give us that and then really kick in that song during an epic moment in the movie. But they give it to us within, what, opening 10 minutes? Yeah, so my opinion on the theme itself is it invokes happiness and bliss for nature. Right. That's what I get from the theme. Yeah, okay? I agree 100%. That's a beautiful way of saying so it. So it makes sense as to why they revealed it when they, or why, why they played it when they did. Okay. Um, because it's it's... Here's the park. Here's everything working in harmony. Awe inspiring. Here's the awe inspiring. Yeah. Here is the volcanic structure in the center of the of the thing. And like, <laughs> right. Everything looks beautiful. The animals seem to be happy. Yeah. It makes sense why they played it when they did. Um, you know what? I would. I, w- I agree. I agree. I wish they waited, but it does make sense. Yeah. I kind of wish that they would have done something like maybe an evolution. Of the theme as opposed to just yes. the theme. Yes. Because what they did, and I kind found... Of, kind of like what you see with what John Williams does with the Star Wars scores. Yes. Is he'll use the same, like, spine, the same idea of the song, the melody, but he mixes it up and kind of, you know, almost like cannibalizes it. Which, that's what they did for the rest of the film. Did they? Yeah. I didn't catch that. Yeah, so... Okay. It, the, 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 the notes are there, but it's so incredibly subtle. Mm-hmm. Um, that you could miss it as you did had you not been paying attention right. to the score. Which, in my opinion, is a great way to do a sequel to a score. Yeah. I can see that. I agree with you. So that's, one, that's definitely a high point for you then. It was the score. To an extent. Okay. To an extent. In the, in the regards that they, they allowed an evolution of the original piece. Okay. Okay. Now, getting back again one more time to the writing, because I know you had a couple points that you were throwing at me, um, is this. Now, writing, sometimes you can blame the clunky writing on the fact that studios just cut, 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 cut. And there might have been scenes that didn't ever even hit. Like, they, were, they ended up at the bottom of the floor in the editing bay, which happens in movies like these. Mm-hmm. You know, so to give, you know, let's defend the writers for a moment. Another thing, when you're dealing with a, a mega blockbuster, multi-million dollar budget type movie... You have to worry about what? Commercials. How do you make your money? And sometimes, I've been in writing, I've been in writing, um, writing panels and writing rooms where the biggest problem sometimes nowadays is television writers and movie writers have this beautiful story written. And then all of a sudden, the big, the CEOs come in, the execs, like, hey guys, we just scored a deal with Pepsi. Or, hey, we just scored a deal with Pizza Hut. We need you to somehow, without insulting the audience, Find a way to make this actor say, boy, I love Pizza Hut or boy, I love Pepsi. And sometimes that just really throws off the chemistry of the writing. You know, it it throws off the the harmony of the script. It really does. And that's something that I felt Jurassic World suffered from. I know you have some examples that were clever, but also a little intrusive. They were, in my opinion, I don't know what happened with product placement in the recent years, but it's front and forward and it really angers me. Um... In this film, product placement is so 
in your face that it is a defining and integral part of the plot. Right. Okay. When they're breeding and setting up the habitat for the Indominus Rex, they're looking for a sponsor for the dinosaur. Okay. Samsung passed on the sponsorship. Okay. The dinosaur is presented as Verizon Wireless presents. Now, listeners the out there, Rex. he's actually quoting a lines from the quoting movie. Quoting lines from the Samsung movie. Samsung passed on it. And Verizon. It was Verizon? It was Verizon, yeah. So yeah. they got two. Two product placement deals right there. <laughs> so, right? yeah. Okay. So I took note of product placement in this film. Okay, Within the first 30 minutes, there's 22 instances of product no, placement. No, give me the I top five. Give me the top okay. five. Beats was the first one. Dr. Dre Beats. That was a little more subtle because you didn't write, would you say? Yeah. Okay. So the next subtle one is the Samsung Galaxy Tab S4. Yes. Okay. And that one shows up as the person waiting for the people at the airport. Yeah. Right? Instead of the subtle. card, mm-hmm. it's, you know, an image on it. Yep, on I remember tablet. that okay. one. Then it's the Hilton Hotel. Okay. That's subtle, subtle. Then it's Brookstone, then it's Winston's, then it's Verizon Wireless, and then it's Jamba Juice, Apple, Mercedes, <laughs> Lego, Starbucks, <laughs> Jimmy, Fa- Jimmy fucking Fallon, oh, Pandora Jewelry Stores, oh, Margaritaville. Like, this whole fucking yeah. thing. It's like... All of the product placement goes away as soon as shit start, starts to be blown up. Yeah, and you know what? And I get, I get it that in today's, it's so in, in today's, it, it really, I would say insulting more, insulting. Like mm-hmm. it's, I get that they have to do it. It's a multi million dollar movie, and they got to get their money and make sure they make money. I get it. It's a commercial. There was a point in the movie where it was a five second shot of a Mercedes Benz commercial. I remember the that. car was at that you know the angle the 45 degrees right. pointing off to the side and right. it was like oh everybody's getting out of the car we're a happy family ha ah! yeah well if people stop pirating movies so much we would probably see this type of product placement go away they do that because of pirating they got to make know. money somehow it sucks and but, it, it mean the the one that i was most insulted by i was like that one of their dinosaur exhibits was actually sponsored by verizon the what the the main villain of the movie the abdo- the main monster i should say the abdominus what is it called the abdominus rex i think i think the abdominus rex that the, was probably the most in your face you're like wow the main building was sponsored by samsung wow mm-hmm. now now imagine uh, andrew for a moment that you're writing a script Okay, and you have this story down, and it's done. You sent in your first draft, and then the writers, the producers come back. Hey, Andrew, this is a great story, but now we need you to go ahead and rewrite this, and we need you to add in Jamba Juice, Mercedes, Samsung, Verizon, uh, Galaxy. Uh, what were the other ones? Uh, Verizon, Pepsi, Coke, Starbucks, Jiffy, Lego. Starbucks. Mike and Ike was in there Can at you point. imagine going back and making your story feel cohesive while you're adding all those elements in? I wouldn't be able to do it. Dude, it's hard. I've as done a, it. I've an, done it. It is miserable. As an artist, I don't think I'd be able to do it. It's very hard, man. It's very hard. So I, when a movie like this, yes, the writing was definitely, the, the I would say, the biggest blight of this, of this uh, summer film, um, but I don't put it all on them. I, I do want to make a point um, okay. on the writing. So coincidences okay. and freak of nature accidents that get our characters into a problem okay. is fine. All right. Okay. It may not be uh, character driven, but hey, it gets a conflict in there. When a coincidence removes that conflict, that's when we have problems. And I feel as if more so toward the end, that's where this film fell apart. And I don't yeah. know if, I don't really want to spoil it for you, but when you see what happens, you will understand exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I agree, man. I think we're on the same page with this. I Usually we do a re- review immediately after the movie, and I think it helped us be able to kind of settle a bit and let us think for a day or so about the film. And that's why we're, I kind of, I think, because I don't think we saw eye to eye right after the movie, right? No. It was, no, I think we had, we had vastly different opinions, and then we come back a day and a half later, and we're like, we almost have you know, opinions that are almost identical. Now, that being said, guys, the, yes, the writing was kind of wonky, but it, I do want to stress that it was an enjoyable movie. I had fun. It, it was a fun movie. It, it, do I, is it a, is it a, it, just go in, as I always say, you know, let me save that part for our final thoughts, but let's get into, is there anything else you want to cover on the writing, Andrew? Um, <sighs> I mean, if you remember something, we can bring it back to it. No, I, I did have a point, but I had lost it. 
Okay. We talked about the score. We talked about the writing. We talked about the acting. Let's talk about a little bit of the controversy surrounding the movie. And then we're going to jump into camera work and visual effects. There's a little bit of controversy surrounding Jurassic Park. And it's the fact that uh, that uh, Bryce Dallas Howard was running around in heels the entire movie. And in I guess, the jungle. In the jungle. And I guess a lot of, uh, you know, the, the modern... I guess pseudo feminists, the internet feminists, the feminazis, whatever you want to call them, they are really going after and kind of t- taking to task the the writers and the directors and the producers of this film, saying, "Why would you guys make her run a- run around in heels the entire movie? It's insulting. It's misogynistic." Go ahead. They also went after Joss Whedon for Black Widow and Avengers too. Yeah, that one I don't agree with at all. I this, don't this one I can I get where they're coming from. If you don't see what they set up from the very beginning with her character, I think it fits her character and her debutantness. She's she's a spoiled rich brat. Okay, she's a debutante. Absolutely. And it kind of fits her character and actually it's it's funny and comical in a way. I mean, and I think it served I mean it was it's it almost like an ongoing joke the entire movie when Chris Pratt says you're going to run around the jungle looking like that and she proved a point and said, "Yeah, I am." To me that's her be- being to me, I looked at it as her being confident with who she is. I didn't right. look at it as him being misogynistic. I can see the other viewpoint. Oh, so can I. However, I I, I'm kind of in a middle ground in that yeah. regard. Um, because there is a point where Chris Pratt says, hey, we can't go run in the jungle with you in heels. And then she unbuttons her blouse, ties it into a knot and rolls up her sleeves. And then she's like, I'm ready to go. And we're like, what are you talking about? You still have heels on. Yeah, that's what I. That's what I did like that part because it was it was funny and it showed it her was character. funny, right? It showed her spunkiness, showed that she's confident with who she is. I don't care what this guy says, and I did like them together. The chemistry between them, I think, worked really well. Honestly, I've always had a thing for uh, Bryce Dallas Howard. Anyways, I've always think she's exceptionally attractive, and it, it may be, let me be uh, she's let me be uh, misogynistic here or a sexist. She's extremely hot. I mean, Absolutely. just beautiful hair, beautiful skin, a very good actress, everything. She's a catch. She's definitely a catch. I'll, I'll go, I'm going to go after her. So stupid. Um, send her some fan mail. So stupid. I said that about Jillian Anderson the other day too. I have a, th- <laughs> <laughs> I have a thing for fair skinned maidens. <laughs> oh, just give me a redhead and I'll be fine. Yeah, red hair and blonde. <sighs> it, pre, it, blonde hair in a point. Irish blonde. Irish oh, blonde's yes. good. All right, Absolutely. we just took it down a creepier out. Speaking of creepy, <laughs> let's get into the a little bit of the... It was, it was funny. There was an element that was kind of awkward to me. Uh, the sibling relationship to me and the boy, they made this hormonal like 16-year-old boy he almost had the gaze of a rapist. He he absolutely did. And um, he wasn't a bad actor, but I wasn't, you know, I think we've all been that route, Andrew, that age where every girl that walks, we're like, oh, God, I love you. Oh, my God. And you kind of look at them longingly when you're a 15, 16-year-old boy because you're very hormonal. You, you can't control yourself. And you just, you want the attention so bad. But they, and they were, this is what they were doing with this kid. He was obsessed with girls. Absolutely. He always was looking at girls. And to me, it felt like, Instead of looking like he was a young, innocent virgin boy, he looked almost his gaze was creepy and rapish. He looked like a man horror. And we're talking about uh, Nick Robinson's character, Zach, who is the older brother to Ty Simpkins character. Yeah. So it didn't. Ju- it wasn't just me. It, no. it was no, kind no, no, of a, no. a rapist gaze. Right. Yeah. I mean, right? he was like 17 or whatever. Yeah, it was. But it was, it was, it, it was creepy. Yeah. Um, but it was funny that the brother, you know, called him out. Maybe that yeah. was the point because I've always said that to my buddies because I've never been that guy at, at a club. You know, you go to a bar and like you, you have guys that check out chicks and like, oh, they're staring at them. Hey, and I'm like, babes, and I'm like, dude, what are you staring at a girl isn't going to make you, what's going to happen by you staring at her like a creep. And that was literally one of my favorite lines in the movie was done by the younger brother. Um, what's his name? Ty Simpkins when he when he saw his brother and his rapist gaze and he's all he's all what do you think is gonna happen he's like what like nine nine years old that's right he did say what do you think is gonna happen just by looking at him (laughs) that's right that's right I loved it dude that crap was funny one of the few moments that I actually like died laughing during the movie even though there were some good moments but uh, on that note let's go into um, let's go into visual effects and camera work now something they did that i thought was exceptional was i'm I'm a sucker for like dystopian society and you know what i mean i've always had that you know what i'm talking about like yes and that's one thing that i thought from the very beginning going in to see this movie i remember the trailers and much of the movie posters the one sheets they kind of 
teased you with that dystopian look. You know, everything's spheres, spheres and white colors, you know. Here, not, here is a perfect world, right. as evidenced by the beautiful and blissful theme song yeah. that we played for you, <laughs> as it's revealed in front of you. Right. And I did like that. I mean, the way they captured a dystopian type society was very gorgeous and beautiful, and it was believable in, in how they captured it. Go ahead. It's believable in the sense that as you take a deeper look, you also see some of the horrors and just really large ethical problems with what they're doing. Yeah, and isn't that usually in a lot of dystopian societies, isn't that the bane of their existence? Yes. Is their own smarts? Their own smarts and their own people is the bane of 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 a dystopia. Yeah, and like and that's what you see. You see within this supposed dystopian go ahead, what? There's a sorry <laughs> This is a, a I can't pretty a wild this, tangent. All... I know, I'm just really excited. <laughs> no, go so ahead. this is kind of a tangent, but there's actually a board game that just came out called wow. Euphoria, called Building a Better Dystopia, mm-hmm. and your biggest problem is if your workers that you're placing on the board get too smart. There you go. Because if they get smart, you either kill them or they leave. See? We're on the right track. We understand dystopian societies. Now, getting back to that, is that that's one thing that I really appreciate about this movie, is you have this dystopian society at face value, it's beautiful, it's a perfect world, it's gorgeous, but at the heart of it is true immoral. It's immoral. Absolutely. At the very heart of it, it's very immoral. And that's something that I've said since the very beginning with the 1993 Jurassic Park. Jeff Goldblum's line has has pretty much you know, has pretty much echoed through the entire franchise is what? I know you want to say it. What's that line he says? You were too busy. Could uh, You were too concerned about whether or not you could. You forgot to stop and think whether or not you should. Right. And that's one thing that this movie did do well. It kind of piggybacked on what Steven Spielberg did before 1993. is, And it's actually discussing, and not in a preachy way, but it was like, hey, should we be doing this? This is so wrong. You're creating life that has ex- that that doesn't exist, and then not only are you creating this life, but then you're not respecting it. You're treating it like how a lot, like in recent times we see what people are doing to cattle and horses and chickens. How they don't even like how people are playing football with the with the chickens in these in these farms. How they're they're, they're not they're not uh, what's it called humane to these animals. So you kind of see that a bit. How. Not only are we messing with life and creating life that shouldn't be living anymore, but now you're abusing life. The first part where that hit me the most is as they're doing the initial show through of the park, uh, there is a baby uh, triceratops um, that you can ride, that little children can ride. Yeah. Right. And it's these tiny, beautiful dinosaurs with hardened leather strapped to their back and children (laughs) riding and kicking them. And immediately I'm like... Okay. Yeah. Let's break out a bad guy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, you know, obviously people know there's a lot of doom and gloom to the story and the dystopian society, like many dystopian society societies fall victim to their own successes. And that's what you see in this movie. And almost it was a very greedy movie. The way it was written, it was greedy. It was all about money, making money Absolutely. and what we can do to how can we abuse this and exploit this to make money and in essence every even i would even uh, i would even dare say andrew and you know disagree or agree that many of the people going to this event are also guilty of greed in their own ways because it, it kind of shows what we do today how we're not even we don't we need to stop and think sometimes of what we're actually taking part in and find out what's really behind the scenes because any normal person in his right mind would be like, yeah, there's something wrong with this. We're riding dinosaurs. They're creating T-Rexes. And just 25 years ago, over a dozen people died. You know, a T-Rex ran through a city Mm -hmm. uh, and was in a pool and killed people. And yet, hey, guys, let's do it again. So ethical problems are very clearly the the bane of this the, the plot the thing, it's definitely the right. theme yes so one of the things with chris pratt's character is he was training velociraptors yeah. that um this gentleman from ingem hoskins wanted to use in war um they wanted to use them in place of german shepherds where they would train these velociraptors yeah. go into camps and just obliterate people um and they were also using genetic modification to achieve that goal as well 
So basically, they were building weapons. They were war dinosaurs. Of course. And you know what? We want to say, well, is, is that even believable? You know what? I don't put nothing past our our government. If there was a way to abuse it and take it as a weapon, I would see it happening. World War Three: Dinosaurs versus Humans. Calling it now. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> That's the next sequel. Jurassic Park, World War Three. There's actually a number of video games that pull that off very well. What? Uh, using dinosaurs? Using dinosaurs as weapons. Yeah, they, they strap cannons and, and machine guns to uh, T-Rexes and to Stegosauruses and to yeah, Triceratops. It's actually happen. very, very good. That would be terrifying. I'd rather give me, give me Hitler back, for Christ's sake. Jesus Christ. I'd rather have Hitler coming at me. At least I can, I can, he's a human being that I can see a target. I mean, a, a fair, fair. And I think Velociraptor? Come on. Not even fair. It's not even a fair fight. <laughs> I would cry. I mean, seriously, man. I mean, do you imagine a dinosaur just coming at you? Just imagine it. So there's an argument that I like to present for people who are very into zombies, mm -hmm. where as if the zombie apocalypse actually did happen, would you be excited or would you be terrified? I want, I, I want that to happen with dinosaurs. Yeah. I don't think right. anybody wants that to happen. I'd rather have zombies, too. Those yeah. slow-moving bastards. So... Let's take it back to the CGI and practical. Okay, um, once, okay, go ahead. Yeah, let's do that. So the, the, the CGI in this film is very good, with a few minor exceptions. Something that the first film did very well is the marriage of practical effects and CGI. It was gorgeously seam seamless. Absolutely. Um, so while most of the CGI shots were very good, there were a few that looked like uh, the editor had looked at a tutorial on how to do something in After Effects on YouTube. And this is painfully evident when the Indominus Rex breaks out for the first time. He flips a car, person's hiding behind the car, complete disconnect. They don't look like they should be in the same scene. Really? I Absolutely. didn't catch that. Maybe I was too, uh, maybe I was throwing up at that point from the IMAX. <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember. So there also isn't, a marriage of the CGI and practical. There is some mm -hmm. practical shots in this film. However, it's like two or three. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, the significant amount. Of CGI. Well, I think we're becoming spoiled as well. Um, as, as technology advances there back in the early two thousands, it was all about CGI. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do now? There's a backlash on it and it's more kind of going back to Jeff Goldblum's, uh, lines again what can we do or what should we do <laughs> right let's that's just the theme of the show like just because you can do it should you do it and let's back it up a bit and i think now you you see shows like game of thrones you see stuff like even what jj abrams now is is doing with star wars you see that people are trying to even terminator salvation did it a lot and you see a lot more movies now trying to take a back step and say listen visual effects are beautiful and they're good they're great and a better example is the mad max movies the the visual effects supervisor specifically said he said I a lot of people keep giving me kudos saying I didn't use visual effects in this I didn't use CGI says there's a lot of CGI the thing I didn't do is I used it sparingly I used it when I couldn't make it for real if I couldn't do it as a practical effect then I would make it as a CGI element and I think that's what's happening with a lot of these movies nowadays and I and there's probably very slim practical effects I would be interested in seeing the behind the scenes I have jumped into a little of the visual effects scenes and I'm going to agree with you on this that there's very few practical effects and and the ones they do connect with the vis with the actual CGI it isn't very seamless you can definitely see it I I would uh, would it be safe to say that we are both in the same boat where CGI should be used as accents it, it, as opposed right. to it should be used when you can't do it in real life yes if you okay. can't look at you can't make someone fly, right, Andrew? Absolutely. So, I mean, I can. I don't know. Right. About you. <laughs> then do CGI. You know, you there's no such thing as dino as dinosaur dinosaurs 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 anymore. So, CGI. You know, space flight is almost impossible. I think eventually we'll probably be filming movies in space in another 15, 20 years. I know they're filming a porno there in there space you go. soon. There you go. But if you can't do it. CGI, but I think it's become a lazy man's way out of doing things because practical effects are more dangerous sometimes because they involve stunt work and, you know, practical effects is anything pertaining to stunts, fire, all that good stuff, explosions. And I think what's happening is it's, it's, it's less, it's not as dangerous and it's a little cheaper to do. Um, and you can do it in post, you know, but I think there is a backlash on it. But for the most part, though, I think there, you said what, there's one or two shots that you didn't like? And yeah. 
visual the, effect shots. Yeah, for the most part, it was yeah. good, but yeah. there were just some very big sore thumbs out there. Yeah, I agree. Um, but for the most part, I think the the look that the I think the cinematographer worked very well with the visual effects supervisor, which is actually Industrial Light and Magic was the company, and the VFX supervisor was Tim Alexander that worked hand in hand with the with the camera team. And I think for the most part, they created a pretty uh, well balanced. I guess picture that looked that worked harmoniously together for the most part besides the couple two shots there was one or two I didn't like but I think you know some things are very easily pick picked out that you know there was a shot of the I guess the Shamu exhibit as we I guess we can call it the one that we're trying to call the Shamu exhibit I mean the 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 backdrop uh, in the background is very you can definitely tell it's a matte painting Mm -hmm. you know which why did we have to do a matte painting of that? Like, I get it. Well, that matte could, paintings are great, but why couldn't they just... They shot on location in a jungle. Why couldn't you use the real trees and that, the real mountains? That could be an homage to the original film where they did use matte paintings. Did they do matte paintings? They did, did a all, f- all. I thought that a lot of them were in the jungle. They it actually, was a lot of a jungle, but there were f- I had at least two paintings, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, But I... I very well could be mistaken. I mean, I know there's set extensions. What set extensions are, hey, there's a mountain scene that we really love. But, hey, we what if the mountain had another range of mountains in the background? That's set extension. Right. Because to a degree, it's more or less, it's more digital map paintings. But then set extension also, hey, look, it, there's a, there's a, there's an old fort here. There's a nice little fort here, and we like that. But we want this fort to be, look more like a castle. Let's add on to it. That's set extension. I'm sure mm-hmm. there's a lot of set extension on this. Um, but that being said, the visual effects, I think, is what's going to sell this movie, because for the most part, people aren't going to pick apart the visual effects. The the going the movie going audience, the summer movie going audience is going to eat these scenes up. And there, I think that is the selling point of this movie is the visual effects. There were quite a few shots that were very much awe. They were awesome. I, I agree. Um, some of these shots didn't occur until the very end of the film. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. At least it was a payoff, right? There yeah. was a payoff for sitting in this in this in this theater. Yeah. Um, okay. The last thing. Let's get into um, what our favorite moments. Favorite moments and why? What was your favorite moment? Do you want me to start? Why you? Think? I want you to start because mine is a spoiler. Okay. My favorite moment in this movie was first. I, I went in knowing that Chris Pratt was was going to control Velociraptors. I was like, uh I mean, if this was the next Machete, the Machete movie, you know, it was a, it was an exploitation B film, then I'd be all about it. I'm like, hell yeah! But this is Jurassic Park. It's based in a real world where those things don't happen. So I went in thinking this is gonna be lame. The way they portrayed it would make sense for the most part. They didn't make them friendly, happy dinosaurs that loved Chris Pratt because he knew them since the time they were hatched. It wasn't like that. They his life was very much at risk. When he got into the the uh, the cage with them, or mm-hmm. he, there was that oh shit, he might get eaten. They're still wild animals, and again, it goes kind of ties back around how how never trust an animal. You can you can train lions and train tigers, but you know what's going to happen if they get into a bad mood? They're going to take a little swat at you. Maybe not intend to kill you, but they're going to kill you because right. they're fucking powerful and they're wild animals. <laughs> <laughs> you know so that's what i kind of like that they played with the realness of that like hey these velociraptors can they're smart they're not dumb animals they're smart so they can be trained but they're also not controlled and they're not little cuddly little creatures that, that love chris pratt and one of the scenes that i thought i was absolutely gonna hate was one of the one of my favorite scenes is when he's riding in the jungle in a motorcycle with the velociraptors and I, and one thing i said you know what and I like this because I was like, they can't just show Chris Pratt looking like a badass on a motorcycle with Velociraptors and there's not a fear, not a care in the world. No, if you look, while he was driving, he kept looking at the dino- at the Velociraptors. He was, ne- he was scared. He was scared that they might, out of nowhere, decide to take a snap at him. And that is what sold that scene for me. The fact that he remained afraid of the Velociraptors, even though they were riding as a pact, he was still had that respectable fear. And that's what made that scene and the moment in this movie one of my favorite moments. That and when uh, that and when um, 
Bryce Dallas Howard was with was laying like classic B movie after she blew away a dinosaur <laughs> and her ass is up in the air. I mean, that was straight up, dude. That was 1960s, absolutely, and th- that was definitely what they were trying to go for. I mean, that was something straight out of a 1960s B movie. It was so beautifully shot. Okay, favorite moment for you? I I have two, I suppose. Um, my first one is the initial reveal of the Indomitable. Okay. okay. And what I mean by that is they revealed it in very much the same way that they revealed the super intelligent raptors from the first film. Okay. It was incredibly well done as an homage, which that homage makes sense later on in the plot line. Um, they didn't reveal too much. They kept it mysterious, which is kind of something that I was kind of hoping that they were going to go for a little bit more yeah, I agree. in this film. Um, kind of make it a little bit more of a horror movie as opposed to a monster movie. Um, my second favorite shot is, can I just outright spoiler it? Yeah, that's Near fine. The very Spo- end. Spoiler, guys, if yeah, you guys are listening, take your headphones off for about 30 seconds. Um, so the T-Rex shows up and is buddies, buddies with the Velociraptor trying to take down the Indominus Rex. Yeah. Okay. They push the Rex into the, uh, fence for the, uh, the 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 Shamu dinosaur. Shamu, yeah, the Shamu, the Shamu dinosaur. dinosaur. So they break the wall on that, and then all of a sudden, this is where my plot point from earlier comes yeah. into play. The Shamu dinosaur just reaches right the fuck up yeah. and just takes them right down into yeah. the deep. And that was like, I saw it coming as the second the fence broke. But I'm just like, I pointed and I I looked over at you, Michael. Yeah, like, dude, dude, look, look, this is gonna be nuts. This is gonna be nuts. Yeah, and it was freaking phenomenal I, I did i like that i agree with you that was a, a gorgeous scene and also i liked it because it's one of the good elements in the writing is that they kind of let us down the trail thinking they didn't give it away saying hey guys this is going to happen but they kept the re- the way they introduced the shamu dinosaur you kind of knew it was going to circle back somehow and mm-hmm. we were and i was kind of waiting for it but then at that point i forgot all about it to tell it happened and when it happened i was like oh there's the payoff it all it makes sense and that was one of the good executions that yeah. they've done in the writing but that's kind of another issue that i have where coincidence is getting characters into a situation is good Char- yeah. coincidence is getting right. them out of a situation is right. bad because the t-rex at that point looked at everybody and said all right deuces yeah well, you know what, and I, I thought when I first saw that scene, I didn't like it, that the T-Rex and the Velociraptor were working together, but after thinking about it for a day and a half, I started, like, you know what, it makes sense, there was a giant dinosaur that was the le- that was the ultimate evil, the T-Rex and the Velociraptor were kind of the lesser of two evils, and in the wild, that would happen with various species of animals, they mm-hmm. would work together to take down the bigger alpha, and then... Although, in a lot of cases, they would turn on each other as soon as the other one was out of the picture. That's the only thing. That scene, I pictured it very much like Terminator 2. Yeah. Where here's the bad guy from the first film coming back to be a good guy. Right, right. But you know, that was kind of where they borrowed from the whole Godzilla. You know, hey, yes, Godzilla yes, yes, helps yes. us. But I did like that. Again, spoiler here, 30 seconds. is That's one thing I liked as well, though, is the end of the movie where... Because they said that. Remember in Jurassic Park in 1993, the T-Rex was the king of... Of the dinosaurs. Do you remember? That's what they said. The I king do. of the dinosaurs. And, and that's why it was so epic when he came out of his cage. Mm-hmm. And at the end, when he does, I'm the king of the jungle, at the very end. I'm going to stand on this building. He stands on the top of the highest point of the building and just burr, growls. Like, Which, what's it called? Roar. He roars. And I kind of, yeah, he growls. <laughs> rrr, 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 I'm the skirt to Rex. <laughs> and he, you know, he, uh, I already forgot the word. What does he do? He roars. He fucking roars, roars dude. God, Jesus dude. Christ. He roars. I'm laughing because you are entertaining in itself watching. You're like this, dude. You're like, you're like I don't know what you're doing back there, but you're you're just as entertaining. <laughs> like, uh, no, like that roaring scene, it kind of made also one of the high points of the movie. Which they also directly homaged and referenced for the last shot of the film yeah. as well. Okay. On final, before we end this review, I want you... Andrew, to give me your final thoughts on it. Should people go see this? Why go see it? Why you shouldn't go see it? Should you wait for DVD? Or should you go to the theater and, and you know, dish out 15, 20 bucks? I admit of, I'm very torn in this regard. Um, this is a type of movie that you do want to see on a massive screen. Okay? Yeah, I agree. Not IMAX 3D because I, I just don't like 3D and this film is not filmed in IMAX so you don't get the full aspect ratio. 
Unless you want to see Bryce uh, Dallas Howard and her hips and, and the, glorious and, size. And three-story booty, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> um, that being said, if you go into a film expecting references and a tribute to the first of a series while not expecting anything new to be built onto that series, go to this film. Okay. It's a good popcorn flick with references to your childhood. Yeah. What if you're a child and, and you've never watched that? Then it doesn't matter. You're going to see dinosaurs. Okay. The first half of that is entirely moot. Okay. If you're a child now and you're going to see it, you're going to see it because either A, your parents dragged you to the film, right. to the theater, or just to see a giant fucking dinosaur. Yeah. And, and you know, going off what you said, I mean, that's another thing I didn't even think about. You know, I keep looking at this as a sequel, but this movie also does one thing really good as well, is that it kind of stands alone as well. Like, you don't have to see the first one. You really don't. But if you do, you will get so much more enjoyment about it. because It's the fun part. It's the fun part, for sure. Yeah, the night vision goggles yeah. Yeah, I from agree. the T-Rex scene show up. Yeah, I totally agree. I 100%. Now, are you any more final thoughts, or is that good? Uh, that's all that I'm going to say. Okay. <laughs> all right. I, I guess my final thought is, you know, this isn't my type of movie. So I'm going to preface that. Like, this isn't my type of movie. I'm a little, you know, I'm not a big guy on summer blockbuster films. So I have to really look at this objectively. And I'm going to say, I suggest that people, I think people, the general audience will enjoy seeing this. Like, check out, leave your brain at home. Don't expect a riveting story. Um, and I think it's an enjoyable summer movie, and that's what, I mean. And but again, you're going to enjoy it more by watching it, on my opinion, on IMAX or 3D or in the theater in general, because this is what this type of movie's made. It's made to be seen in that way, in my opinion, in 3D, in in a glorious giant screen. Maybe not IMAX, but it's made to be seen in the theater. You're not going to get the wow effect watching this on your television at home or on DVD. You're just not. I will relate all of what you had just said to the film Pacific Rim. Okay? I saw Pacific Rim in theaters on a uh, Cine Capri screen, okay? which is just a little bit smaller than an IMAX. I later watched that same film at home on a 60-inch television with surround sound, like the whole nine, and I didn't get the same feeling. Yeah. So if, This is that film. Yeah, you need to go see this. If you wait, you're going to be disappointed, and you're going to be like, eh, this movie's not that good, because the, I'll be honest, the movie isn't that good. It's probably a C plus, honestly, but what makes it exciting is the fact that, hey, it's a summer movie, Chris Pratt rides on, on a motorcycle with dinosaurs, there's a, there's a badass chick, there's a badass dude, there's badass dinosaurs, there's action, explosions, and that's what you're going to get. People want to see dinosaurs, and the only films that have done dinosaurs right are the Jurassic Park films. Right. And going, one final thought is this. Did the director of this movie do a good job, Colin Trevorrow, did he do a good job recapturing the magic of the original? No. No, absolutely not. The magic of the original has not been recaptured and will not be recaptured until the directors and the writers of the Jurassic Park franchise decide to bring us all new, fresh, unique concepts and ideas, which this franchise from the very beginning has been a victim of its own uniqueness. It's very hard. It's very hard to give you a fresh outlook in this type of movie. It really is. Go ahead. I see you jumping around again. <laughs> I do. No, I have a point. Um, so the first film to draw was the dinosaurs, right? Right. Mainly did the T-Rex. The second film was two T-Rexes mm -hmm. fighting, right? The third film was the Spinosaurus. Okay? And this one, it's the Indominus Rex. Yeah. Right? Plot-wise, those are the main attractions. Right. Okay. The films are, are a caricature of themselves. Yeah. What I mean by that is the films have to go bigger and better to get more and more people to see them so mm -hmm. they don't lose relevancy. And in the same respect, the the parks are doing the exact same thing. Yeah, I agree. That's a very good. That's good parallelism. It really does. It makes sense. I agree. So, I guess we could say go. We both are suggesting to see the movie, but don't expect the original magical feel of the nineteen ninety three movie. I think this movie will lose its prestige and its oddness if you wait to see it 
on DVD or Blu-ray. You need to see this now. Otherwise, you're going to be like, Meh, I don't understand the excitement of this movie. Because what makes it exciting is the, the giant dinosaurs that are giant. And some people, you know, like Ryan Denton, who's on this network, actually told me when I told him I didn't like the movie, he's all, dude, dra- Chris Pratt on a motorcycle riding with dinosaurs, that's all I need to know, man. Don't you think too much? I'm like, well... There's a lot of people out there that w- that want more than just action and explosions. And I don't I think that's something that a lot of people make an excuse now that I don't agree. They say, "Hey man, what'd you expect? You know, it's a summer blockbuster movie." I'm like, "There are a lot of summer blockbuster movies that have good writing." Absolutely. And I think why why and why should we comp why should we be okay with that? Because hey, it's a summer movie. It's not that hard to sit down and write a very good script with explosions. And 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 action scenes. You could still make that movie with a dynamic, well written, well thought out script. I think what it is is just the laziness of these tent pole movies. Period. I would agree. Um, so, go ahead. While it is laziness in writing, I still had fun. I did too. I, and that's something that I'm kind of ashamed about. <laughs> So stupid i you know what that's why i'm so conflicted because i did enjoy watching it but i'm watching it i'm like this isn't good but it I is know, i know <laughs> that's the because i mean we're as as fans and as critics and as just general public we want original ideas and we yeah. want original ips and if we keep going to see these movies while we're having fun we're also promoting the behavior yeah so we're shooting ourselves mm-hmm. in the own foot by enjoying a film that just has bad writing yep all right, everybody, thank you for listening. If you ever want to find more of our shows, you can always go to RainManWasHere.com and follow the entire uh, Rain Man Digital Network. Uh, thank you for listening, and we will be back soon. Actually, next week, we have a review on Homes. All right, are you still doing that I th- with me? I think so. Saturday or Monday morning? I should be. Okay, so we'll be back next week with another. Actually, me and Andrew again. <laughs> uh, we are, we're going to be reviewing Ian McKellen's latest film, Holmes, which is a take on uh, Sherlock Holmes as an older man. So we'll see you next week. Doodles. The Corova Milk Bar sold Milk Plus. Milk Plus, Velocet, or Sintamesk, or Drencrum, which is what we were drinking. This would sharpen you up and make you ready for a bit of the old ultraviolence.